I'm honored and just honored and blessed to be here today and to share with all of you an interesting journey. And I, and I tell you, this is a, this is a messy story with a, with a great ending. But it was definitely a messy story where I'm going to share with you. It started when I was 32 years old. That was five years ago, by the way, when I was 32. It was actually 33 years ago. I turned 65 here this past, past weekend. And I'm going to share this journey with you about, uh, you know, when I didn't know God. And I'm going to talk about how I met God and in the last 24 years, how it's changed my life. Uh, and it has been a life change because really what I'll be sharing about is, is really an example of of selfish leadership because when I was in my 30s I was for sure a selfish leader I'm not proud of those days uh, I didn't even know what servant leadership was in those days and I had three people above me at one of the largest companies in the world we were number 56 on the fortune 500 and uh, 70 billion in revenue 30,000 employees and I was ranked number four uh, executive I was divisional president of the biotech division which is things like uh, lactic acid and citric acid and ethanol and some of the key products that Archer Daniels Midland produces. And I was president of that division and I was also corporate vice president of the company uh, during that time. And, and I got caught up in the world. I had mentors in my life and they weren't mentors that were ever even used the word selfish or, or servant leadership. Uh, and they never used the word selfish leadership either, even though that's what we were living. And we were definitely living it day in and, and day out. So I'm going to kind of share this journey and, 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 and a journey of brokenness, how I met God uh, during that journey in my, in my 30s and, and talk about the last 24 years in terms of how, how I'm really kind of finding purpose in my life because uh, I sure had no purpose uh, during that time. Some of the questions we're going to be answering today are the following. We're going to be talking about is, is our work important to God? And it's extremely important, but we're going to be talking about that. We're even going to be sharing a little bit of scripture about how our, our work is very important to God. Personally, I think there's no better place for ministry than the workplace. And I, that's what I like about Southeastern Baptists here. They really equip leaders and young leaders to, to integrate faith in work. And I mean, work is really a ministry. Matter of fact, we look at our company at Coca-Cola Consolidated as a ministry that happens to be in the beverage business. And that's how we view it. I mean, our purpose statement at our company is, is our only purpose is to honor God in all we do, to serve others, pursue excellence, and to grow profitably. So there really is, to me, in, I don't know if you remember Billy Graham and Christianity Today in an interview several years ago. He said the next big revival will be in the workplace. And we really see that happening. We see an awakening happening in the marketplace about work. We're also going to be talking about what does God say about our work? And we're going to talk specifically about some of those. We're going to talk about what an effective servant leader looks like or an ambassador for Christ. What does that look like? We're going to be talking about, uh, about that. And we're talking about what a selfish leader looks like. We're kind of going to start with that because if you're not a servant leader, you're a selfish leader. And I've lived both. And I'm kind of going to be starting a little bit about selfish leadership because it's a, it's a good way to know the difference between that and servant leadership. And a selfish leader is for sure not what we, what we want to be. I've lived that, and there was, no, there was no rewards for doing that. And it was rewards that you would have from the world. I mean, the house that I lived in, the cars that we drove. But, boy, I look back 30 years ago, those cars— you know, I had an eight-car garage with eight cars, had a Ferrari. I mean, those cars are all rust now, 30 years later. There's no eternal value at all in selfish leadership. And what is the purpose of lives? We're going to be sharing about that. And I thank God that God sent two individuals into my life, servant leaders, that changed my life forever. And I'm going to be sharing a little bit about how I, how I met these two individuals and and one of them actually lives here in, the, in, the, in this area, too. He lives in Raleigh, and I'm going to be sharing, showing some pictures and, and sharing about him, how they read about me in the newspaper, two individuals, and how they reached out to me and planted seeds that changed my, that changed my life. As I mentioned, I worked for a company called ADM, Archer Daniels Midland. I was there for almost eight years. Started when I was 32. I was divisional president. It was Jonathan said of, of the biotech division and corporate vice president of the company. The CEO was 75. The president was 69, and I was 32, and I was ranked number four executive. So here are these guys, 75 and 69. I had plenty of re room to, to move up. They were double my age, 
And ADM is one of the largest food additive companies in the world. If you buy a processed food in the grocery store, like a Pillsbury, a Kraft, a Kellogg cereal, a beverage like a Sprite or a Coke or Gold Peak tea or an orange juice, really any processed food that you buy in the grocery store, it would be difficult to find a food. And you look at that ingredient label on the side of the package that does not have something from Archer Daniels Midland in it, one of the largest food additive companies in the world. Like I said, 32 years ago, 1989, we were 70 billion in revenue, 30,000 employees, and number 56 on the Fortune 500. And I think they're number 48 or 49 on the Fortune 500 today. So even larger, larger today. And I do wanna make it clear, because it's gonna be sharing some things about ADM. ADM then, as they do now, had 30,000 hardworking people that went to work doing the right thing every day with the right moral compass. But they did have four bad apples at the top, and I was one of those bad apples. But the CEO, the COO, the vice chairman, and myself, divisional president. So it's not a bad company. It was kind of like the Enron and WorldCom case had great people, but it had bad leadership. And I was part of that uh, part of that leadership at that time. I remember my first week after they hired me there, and we got there from uh, from from Germany, and I was doing joint ventures with ADM from Germany, and I was there four years in Germany, and that's how I got to know ADM. I was doing some joint ventures. We were looking at building plants in Europe and Asia together, and I got to know the CEO and COO very well. And I remember the CEO said, "Well, why don't you come work for us, Mark? You seem to be caught up in a lot of bureaucracy here." at Degusa, which is now known Avonic. It's like a 300-year-old, one of the largest chemical companies, right after BASF and Journey B, the second largest chemical companies. And he said, why don't you come work for us, the CEO of ADM said. And I said, I'm six years here. I'm four years in Germany. I was two years in New York with Degusa. They have large plants in Mobile, Alabama also. And I said, I can't imagine ever leaving this company. And I tell you, I look back, I had the right mentorship. These guys had... A, a, the right moral compass. And I really, looking back, I should have stayed where I was, but I was so caught up in the world, wanting to move up the corporate ladder so quickly, I, I listened to what, this, uh, what the CEO was uh, describing. And he said, well, he said, well, how much do you earn? And I, we were in Deutschmarks, and this is even before Euros in, in 1989. And so he told me, you know, I kind of calculated in US dollars, and I told him, and basically he put a package together that was ninefold ninefold increase. And I said, where do I sign? After I spent an hour telling him there's no way I'm leaving. I said, where do I sign? So I joined the company. And by the way, that was not a ninefold base salary. It was with bonuses and stock options, a total compensation. And, and I, I was so caught up in the world. I said, where do I sign? I remember coming home and telling Ginger, we're moving to Decatur, Illinois, three hours south of Chicago. She said, where, what, what are we doing here? And she said, you didn't do it for the money, did you? And uh, I said, Ginger, it was so much different, significant difference in increase in money. I said, we couldn't pass this opportunity up, so we're, so we're moving. And I, and I could tell she was really uh, concerned from the get-go if we made, uh, made the right decision. I remember the first week I was working there, the 75-year-old CEO came back to my office, and he said, Mark, the seven top executives have access to the seven jets. They had six uh, Falcon 50s and a Falcon 900. The CEO had the Falcon 900 most of the time. So I had access to the, one of the seven executives for the seven jets. So I had access to one of the Falcon 50s. And I tell you what, the best way to describe what I'm about ready to say now is this. I was Justin Bieber before Justin Bieber. I mean, I really thought I was a rock star. I mean, 32 years old, a 75 year old CEO, a 69 year old president, the age that I was in that position, making seven figures in total compensation, 1989, seven figures with the bonuses and stock options and having a jet my first week there. And I remember the third week he came back to my office. I kind of liked him coming back in my, coming back in my office. I was like a kid in a, in a candy store. And, and he said, Mark, you moved your family yet to, to the U.S.? And I said, well, we've been looking at, at homes. We're, we're working with a realtor, and we're going to be moving soon when the school ends, kind of in December. I started in October 89. In December, that way the kids finished uh, their term in school and would start a new term in January of 1990, because this would have been October of 89. So why don't you buy my home? And I said, well, tell me about your home. He said, well, it's 13,000 square feet. Uh, he wanted to move to something smaller, eight-car garage. He lived in about 30 years. It was the original home of John Daniels, the founder of Archer Daniels Midland, 115 years earlier. 
um, the former founder, John Daniels of Archer Daniels Midland, and it was his home. So everyone that lived in that home was a CEO of ADM. And I thought, well, if I have this home, I'll be CEO of ADM some point. I mean, that's how ambitious I was, even to the point where it was unhealthy, an unhealthy ambition. Should have been happy already to be divisional president. And I was already thinking about uh, moving, moving ahead at some point. So he, uh, he told me about his home and I said, I don't think I could, it sounds like a great home, had horse riding stables where your kids ride an inside arena uh, during, the, during the winter time because Decatur, Illinois has some pretty tough uh, winters. And, and, he, and I said, I don't, you know, I said, I don't think I could handle, I'm seven years out of college by that point and graduated from Cornell at age 25 and I was 32. I said, I don't think I could get a home like that yet. And he said, nonsense, I'll give you a startup bonus today. And I was three weeks there and he gave me a startup bonus that was a down payment for his home. I look back and in reality, we should have probably went to prison just for that, for that transaction. And I bought that home, our third week working there and, and lived in a, in a mansion. And then I really thought I was Bon Jovi, uh, moved up from uh, Justin Bieber at that point. So very greed focused, had the wrong moral compass and it was all about me. And it was an example of selfish leadership, without a doubt. I was caught up in the world at that point, no doubt. And it was not the moral compass that I grew up with. I grew up in a small town uh, north of Cincinnati with a thousand people town, wonderful parents, Christian parents forced me to go to church. My brother and sisters did not go to college and they uh, became uh, Christians, but I got caught up in the world. And to me, when I was going to church with my parents, it was one ear and out the, and out the other. I was, did not have God in my heart, even though I was hearing a lot about God during that time. I wouldn't have stole an apple from a neighbor uh, during that time, but somewhere when I got to this level of position and power, I lost my moral, my, I lost my moral compass at that point. So let's fast forward a little bit now. I'm a couple years with the company, and I do remember when we were looking at uh, clothes for our four-year-old son now, who's almost 37 soon here, and he was four years old, and we were looking for clothes at a clothes store in Decatur, Illinois. It was my first month there, and it was Ginger's first chance to meet uh, one of the executives. Uh, the COO, the president, who they were actually grooming me to take, his to take his place, to go from divisional president to company president, he was buying clothes for his grandson. He was the 69-year-old president, but not the 75-year-old CEO. And first time Ginger had met someone at, at ADM, and we're buying clothes. I introduced Ginger. He looked out, and he pointed at a car, and he had a yellow Ferrari, and he told Ginger, he said, I'm going to make your husband a very rich man. And he said he had 14 cars like that, 14 special cars. And I tell you, I was so excited to hear all this. And when he walked out, and this is my first month there, Ginger said, Mark, the hair is standing up on the back of my neck. She said, I think we made the worst mistake we've ever made in our life. I said, what are you talking about? Look what he just said to us. She said, he didn't say anything about what the company does for the community. He didn't say anything about the 30,000 employees. All he did was point at his car and talked about how he's, going to, how he's going to make you a rich man and said, Mark, I think, I think this, you're going to lose your way. I think we made a huge mistake. And Ginger said that my first month working there. Now let's fast forward a couple years. I'm totally immersed in the company. And the, comp the, the vice chairman came back to my office and said, Mark, you're like family now. We trust you. You've been here a couple years. I would have been 34 years old then. He said, we're going to bring you into how we do business. And I said, well, I've been here two years, divisional president. I know how we do business. He said, no, there's something we've not shared with you. And he started sharing with me how they were working with competitors for over a decade and how they had an international cartel. And they wanted to start mentoring me to eventually take that over. And I remember asking him, I said, Mick, is that legal? And he said, it's not legal, Mark, but he said, the ones that put these antitrust laws on the books, these politicians, they know nothing about business, nothing. He said, these laws are from the 1800s and they shouldn't even be on the books for the United States. He said, you cannot be in the commodity business without doing this, working with your competitors, fixing prices and having this cartel like they have had for over a decade. And I said, boy, Mick, I don't know. And he said, Mark, I'm telling you, everybody does it. And all of our competitors do it. We've been working with them for over a decade, and this is the way business is done. And about an hour before that, he had handed me a $100,000 check and 25,000 shares of stock, which was about a million dollars about an hour before that. Then I knew what the money was for. And I, and, I, and I thought about it, and I tell you, that's when I got to the fork of the road, and I should have left. But I didn't. I was so 
addicted and obsessed with that lifestyle I had for two years. I couldn't walk away. And really, at that point, was probably the biggest mistake of my life because I stayed and I was mentored how to, how to manage this cartel and was learning how to eventually run this international cartel where we would fix prices of the ingredients that are in your foods that you would buy in the grocery store. And we were earning hundreds of millions of dollars extra, extra profit each year, sometimes a billion dollars a year from this crime, from this price fixing scheme that I was learning and being mentoring. Well, Ginger, I met Ginger when we were uh, very young and we met when we were seventh grade and eighth grade. Uh, we met, went to all our high school proms, uh, all our high school proms together. So I kind of looked like Justin Bieber a little bit there. And, um, and so that's when we met. And so she knew me since I was 14 and she was 13. And seven months into this cartel, she asked me, she said, Mark, what's going on with your life? She became a Christian at age 30. So she was a Christian by this point. We were 34 at this point. And I was not. I didn't become a Christian until 40. And she asked me, she said, Mark, what's going on with your life? And I said, well, what do you mean, Ginger? We live in a mansion. We have an eight-car garage. I've got a Ferrari. I'm driving around on a corporate jet. And Ginger's driving a used, an old used Jeep. And she didn't want a new car. She thought her Jeep, uh, Jeep was fine. So the cars meant nothing to her. I would have bought her a Ferrari if she wanted one, but they meant absolutely nothing to her. And she said, Mark, something's changed these last seven months. You've been there two years, but something's changed these last seven months. She said, you're on the phone all these hours in the evening that you'd have dinner with the family, then you're on the phone for three or four hours. And I really want to find out what's going on. What has changed these last seven months, Mark? And I told her how I was being groomed to take over an international cartel. And she never heard the word cartels or price fixing. It didn't mean a whole lot to her. She was a stay-at-home mom raising her three kids. And she said, well, what does that mean? And I said, well, we get together with our competitors and we fix the prices of food ingredients and we make hundreds of, billion, hundreds of millions of dollars extra, sometimes a billion dollars a year. And they've been doing it for 12 years, well before I joined the company. She said, how long are you involved, Martin? I said, seven months. They see me as family now and they brought me into it seven months ago. She said, I don't know, Mark. She said, if they're making extra hundreds of million dollars, who pays for that billion dollars a year? And I said, well, basically the consumers, they buy $50 worth of groceries. They pay three or $4 extra out of $50 of groceries from some of the ingredients that are price fixed in those foods. And she said, you mean my grandma on $200 a week, social security is paying this and we live in a mansion. She said, Mark, I don't know if I can live with this. She said, it sounds like fraud to me, an outright fraud, an outright theft. And she said, I can't believe you got involved with this. She said, I'm very disappointed. She said, you're not the person I fell in love with in high school. And then she said she was going to go pray about it. And we talk about it later. When she told me she was going to pray about it, I knew I was in trouble. I knew I was in trouble at that moment. She came back a couple hours later and she said, Mark, God led her to a decision. And she said, you've got to turn yourself in. And I said, Ginger, if I turn myself in, I could go to prison for breaking antitrust laws. I said, Ginger, the CEO is a billionaire. He's 30 years as CEO. He's best friends with President Clinton. He flew to President Clinton's, uh, Nixon's funeral on President Clinton's plane. He's on the phone a regular basis, a couple times a month with President Clinton. This guy will destroy us. And I never forget, this was November 5th, 1992, I was 34. And she would have been 33. And she said, you know what, Mark? She said, my CEO is bigger than your CEO. And I said, Ginger, who is your CEO? And she said, her CEO is Jesus. And I said, well, Ginger, I can't feel Jesus. I can't touch him. I don't know him. I've heard a lot about him even since my childhood, but I don't know him. But I know my CEO and he lives seven miles down the road. He lived in this very house for 30 years and they're going to destroy us if we do this. She said, God will protect us and we're going to do it and we're going to do it today. And I've known her since she was 13 when she says something like that because she was very quiet. But whenever she had something she was committed to, boy, she met it. And within a couple hours, we're sitting. And when she told me she'd rather be homeless than live in a house where illegal activity is, 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 is ongoing, I knew she met it. And within a couple hours, we're sitting with the FBI and sitting with the FBI for four hours. I don't know how many of you ever went and told the FBI you're still in a billion dollars a year, but it's an interesting, uh, interesting reaction. Basically, the FBI, we started sharing and they asked me, they said, now, Mark, what's going on? And I told the FBI, I said, 
well, look, uh, you guys got all these drug dealers out here, all these bank robbers. This is nothing. This is not worth talking about. You, you've got so much more important things to do. And he said, well, tell me about it. How big is this case? And I said, really, you've got so many more important things to do. And then Ginger said, it's a billion dollars. And the FBI said, a billion dollars? And Ginger said, yes. He said, how long is this going on? I said, you've got all these drug dealers out here and bank robbers. So many more important things to do. And Ginger said, it's been going on 12 years. And then the FBI said, how long have you been involved? And I told him, I said, I've been involved for seven months. They're starting to mentor me how to do it. So he got all the truth out of Ginger quickly. And, and we had a choice after four hours for, for Ginger said, act like my lawyer. We had no lawyer with us. This was just two uh, young, naive people in front of law enforcement, not with any experience with anything like this at all. And Ginger said, well, we can go home now, right? You can tap phones or do whatever you do. We, we, you know, we, Mark did the right thing. We, he, you know what's going on now. He's only seven months and it's been going on 12 years. He didn't start the price fixing scheme. And the FBI said, no, he can't go home. We either have to arrest your husband today or he has to start wearing a wire and be an informant tomorrow. And that's how I became an informant uh, on November 6th, the next day, 1992. Uh, three FBI agents wired me up, shaved my chest, put microphones on my chest, put a tape recorder on my back and wrapped it with an athletic band to hold it there. Had another tape recorder and a notebook and a third tape recorder and a, and a briefcase. And I wore a wire for the FBI eight, nine, 10 hours a day, whatever my work day would have been that day, wore a wire every day for three years. For three years. Uh, it, the, the, I did a, seven events for the FBI in the last 20 years, and one of them was in 2011 at the Quantico FBI Academy, and they told me it was the longest duration of anybody wear a wire in U.S. history, and they put all the equipment I wore undercover in the FBI Museum, because uh, it was the largest price-fixing case in history, started by Ginger, not by me. They say I'm the highest level executive to be a whistleblower in U.S. history. The whistleblower in this case is Ginger Whitaker, and not me. Case would have never happened without Ginger. And, and there's a difference between a whistleblower and an informant. When you read a whistleblower in the newspaper, that's someone who sacrifices everything to do the right thing. And that was Ginger. An informant is someone that's sitting in front of the FBI and has a choice to be either arrested or wear a wire. And that was me. And a huge difference, uh, huge difference between the two. So that's how I became an informant. When the FBI would wire me up, they'd say, Mark, if these guys catch you, they're going to kill you. And I heard that a couple times a week for three weeks, or for three years, the three years I wore a wire. And matter of fact, when I spoke at Quantico, they told me they don't allow anyone to wear a wire longer than a year because what they saw happen is people like me who wore one for three years. So they actually have a guideline not to wear a wire longer than a year now because you fall apart. I mean, I lost 60 pounds. People at work thought I had cancer. They were the highest adversity years that I ever had in my life. Two things. One, they, when they're telling me, Mark, if these guys catch you, they're going to kill you. And the second thing is thinking what the CEO is going to do when he learns that I'm a witness against him. That was constantly, constantly on my, on my mind. So after uh, three years wearing a wire, well, why don't I show this right here, though, this lamp. They, they knew they were going up against one of the largest uh, companies in the world, the FBI did. So they wanted to capture on tape, videotape also. So the video camera was in this lamp right here that I'm sharing here. The video camera was in that lamp and I would tell the FBI where the meetings are gonna be, obviously. They would get in the next room and control with a remote control of the video camera in that lamp. And they could zoom in whoever was, uh, whoever was talking at that time of the 11 different competitors that met at these international cartel meetings. And you know that green lamp was at the Shangri-La Hotel with 11 guys thousand dollar night hotel the lamp looks like it came from a yard sale it was five feet from us almost to the bottom of that step right there to me sitting at a little corner table and then two weeks later that same green lamp same 11 guys was at the mandarin hotel in hong kong a few weeks after that the same green lamp same 11 guys was at the four seasons hotel in chicago and then a maui hawaii and that green lamp was at two or three meetings a month, the same 11 guys, five feet from them for three years, two or three times a month. I look back and I say, thank God there was not a woman criminal among us. Because <laughs> if there was a woman criminal among us, 
a woman would have said, you know what, that green lamp has fallen us around the world. <laughs> and I tell you what that shows, looking back 30 years, what that shows me, and it's so clear now, greed blinds you. Greed absolutely blinds you. They saw the millions of dollars that they were going to get in bonuses from this crime that they didn't even see what was five feet from them, which was this green lamp, until there was a seven-week trial in Chicago. 30 people went to prison in this case, four from ADM alone, and that green lamp was brought in, and they slapped themselves in the head, and then they remembered the green lamp, but it was too late. The, the, the tapes were played to the jury, and when one tape was played to a jury, it was at the Sheraton Hotel in 1993 in, uh, in a hotel at the Land Airport. Sheraton's not even there today, but it was in 1993, there was a meeting where that green lamp was at, and I had the audio tapes on me, and someone knocked for refreshments. Uh, the hotel, someone works the hotel to bring refreshments in the conference room. And one of the co-defendants said, oh my gosh, I bet it's the FBI. And this is all tape and video. And another one said, oh my gosh, let's get our hands out. They're gonna have to handcuff us. And then someone else said, the FBI is so stupid, they'd never catch something this sophisticated. And everybody laughed about it. And that was played to a jury during a seven week trial in Chicago. I could see the jury's face. Everybody was gonna be convicted and it's gonna be quick because it shows they knew about a billion dollar crime and they knew about it and laughed about it. And the, so those videotapes did have high value. So I understood then why they wanted to have it all in videotape too, not just audio tape. The FBI gave me a deal of a lifetime. And the deal of a lifetime was a Martha Stewart sentence, six months. The others are gonna to go to prison for several years. I was gonna to go to prison for six months to a white collar camp like Martha Stewart went to. And my lawyer calls me in Chicago, says, Mark, a deal of a lifetime. Ginger's there with me and I said, six months, boy, wore a wire three years. I know I made some huge mistakes, but six months in prison. And Ginger said, Mark, I beg you. By this time I was 38 years old after wearing a wire for three years. She said, Mark, I beg you, you come go to prison at 38, you come out at 38. Let's get this behind us. And I looked at Ginger and the second biggest mistake I ever made in my life, the largest mistake was to get involved with price fixing in the first place. The second biggest mistake I ever made in my life, I looked at Ginger and said, Ginger, you're the reason I'm in this mess in the first place. I had to wear a wire because of her, I told her. I had to wear a wire because of her for three years. Now I got to go to prison six months only because of her. For that, I'm going to do the opposite you want me to do. And I ripped up the plea agreement, fired the lawyer on the spot who recommended it, hired another whole group of lawyers the next day and fought the case through the courts for three years to get eight and a half years instead. Boy, I showed Ginger, didn't I? I was my own worst enemy every step of the way. FBI was helping me, Ginger was helping me, everybody was helping me, and I was my own worst enemy every step of the way and had to go to prison for eight and a half years instead of six months. So instead of going to prison at 38 and get out at 38, after three, week, three years in the courts, I went to prison at 40 and got out at age 49. I was so depressed at that time, I pulled my car in one of the garages and tried to kill myself. I wrote a 17 page letter to Ginger and I tried to take my own life. At that point, I wanted to die. I could not imagine going to prison for eight and a half, for eight and a half years. Well, the movie ends with everybody going to prison. The movie, The Informant, there's three books on the case. New York Times wrote The Informant, very similar to like reading The Firm, the, the John Grissom uh, movie, the one that Tom Cruise plays uh, in the movie, the John Grissom book, very serious drama. Then Rats in the Grain wrote a book, uh, an antitrust lawyer. Probably, probably 100 years from now will probably be the most detailed of, of, all, the, of all the books. Now those books came right when I went to prison, so I wasn't uh, a Christian. And they, they end with me going to prison, those books. And then Against All Odds was written about 10 years later, and that has a lot what I'm gonna start sharing now, kind of what happened after I went to prison, more the faith, the faith journey. So I'm gonna share a little bit about, uh, about that, kind of the rest of the story. That's in the book, Mark Whitaker, Against All Odds. Now, Hollywood did a movie of the book, The Informant, the New York Times book. And again, it was a serious drama, it's like The Firm. And Jenner and I could relate a lot to The Firm movie. We felt that's the life we lived when we watched The, the Firm but they made a comedy out of it and the 
FBI was so upset that it was a comedy, they did a documentary to combat the movie. And the documentary is on my website, markwhitaker.com, and that's by Discovery Channel with the three real FBI agents. And people watch the documentary, it's on our website by Discovery Channel, and they watch the movie and say, this is two different, two different stories. So Hollywood was looking more for entertainment than to, than to document, uh, document the story. Uh, but the documentary is on my website, markwhitaker.com, and the movie is also on my website linked there, so you can see either one from my website. That's Ginger and I, Ginger and I with my identical twin, Matt Damon. I think you can see why they chose him with me looking just like him. He's the one in the middle, by the way, if you didn't know which one, which one, which one he was. Now the movie ended in prison. Did life end when I went to prison in 1998 at age 40? I thought it did. I'm 65 now, 25 years ago. I thought life did end. But in reality, life was just, life was just starting, but I did not know that yet. Again, I tried to take my own life even before I went to prison. So I want to share a little bit about the rest of the rest of the story. Well, someone read about it in the newspaper as all this was going on, including the suicide attempt. He was from the Raleigh area, CFO of a biotech company named Ian Owls. And he was also part of a group called Christian Businessmen Connection, CBMC. And, and it, five young children, school age and younger, a couple of them adopted, his wife an attorney. And he reached out to me, a stranger, I didn't know him. And he said, Mark, Prison's going to be the beginning of your life. This is seven months before I went to prison. This is a month after I attempted suicide. And he said, Prison's the begin prison is going to be the beginning of your life. And you're going to find your purpose in your life through this journey. This was the strangest kind of language I, was, I ever heard. And I remember telling Ginger, I said, Ginger, there's somebody out on the porch that's crazier than I am. And I remember her saying, it can't be. And I said, this guy says, prison's going to be the beginning of my life, and I'm going to find my true purpose in my life. She fell to her knees in tears, and she said, thank God, God sent somebody. She said, Mark, I've been praying for you for 10 years. For 10 years, I've been praying for you with your greed addiction and your self-absorption and not the person you grew up. You became a changed man, and I've been praying for you for 10 years. And Mark, your parents have been praying for you for your whole life. And I pray you go listen to this man that God sent. And I pray you go listen to what he has to say. And I went out and told Ian, I said, Ian, what do you have in mind? And he said, Mark, I'm going to take you through a study called Operation Timothy, a Bible study. I'm going to introduce you to God. And I'm going to introduce you to Jesus. And I said, Ian, I already know God. I went to church as a youngster. I go to church with my wife and kids these last 10, 10 15 years. I said, uh, I already know God. He said, Mark, I'm not talking about going to church. I'm talking about a personal relationship with Jesus. And I'm going to introduce you to him. Ian Howe spent five, six, seven hours a week with me for seven months and introduced me to God. A very busy CFO, five young children, and he spent all that time with me, introduced me to God and introduced me to Jesus. And I remember telling Ian, I said, Ian, my sins are too big. I don't think God can forgive me. Look what I've done in my life. And there's much more than I've done that I'm going to prison for. And he said, Mark, God will forgive your sins no matter what they are. And he'd go through scripture and show me and share with me how Jesus died on a cross for my sins. And we spent hours going through this. And then I remember my second month, seven months later, my second month in prison, or second week in prison, this man showed up, Chuck Colson. Chuck Colson was the White House counsel under President Nixon, who went to prison in the 70s for Watergate scandal. He was, and he became a Christian during that journey. And he started a group called Prison Fellowship that disciple inmates. And he showed up, he read about me in the Washington Post, and he saw where he went to Brown, University, I went to Cornell, both of us Ivy League. He went to be a lawyer. I got a PhD in biochemistry, both of us eight years of education. And he said, Mark, this is going to be the beginning of your life. And I said, well, Ian Howes has been telling me that for seven months. He said, well, tell me more about that. What are you talking about? And I told him about Operation Timothy and hearing about God and learning about God. And he said, Mark, have you surrendered your life to Jesus yet? And I said, I haven't. And I said, but I haven't for only for one reason. I said, I had eight years of college in the sciences and all I heard from all those professors those years for me where I went to school and the professors I had, that there is no God. Even one of the professors at Cornell, 
that I had great respect for during that time. He said, if you're a PhD scientist, you can't, if you're a Christian, you can't be a PhD scientist. If you're a Christian, you can't be in my class. And after hearing that for eight years, I thought my parents at age 22, when I started at Cornell as a PhD student, I thought my parents were Christians only because they didn't go to college is what I thought at that time at age 22. And I shared that with Chuck. And I remember Chuck asking me this, a very smart, brilliant man, died 10 years ago last week. It was 10 years ago on April 21st. And he said, Mark, he said, do you think there's a PhD scientist that believes in God? And I said, no, I don't think there's any. And he started inundating me, article after article and book after book of some of the most well-known scientists that believe in God. First article, he showed me that Albert Einstein said only God could create the universe and only God could create man and the Big Bang Theory is impossible. Boy, I sure never learned that at Ohio State or Cornell. Then he showed me a memoir by Sir Isaac Newton where Sir Isaac Newton wrote as much about Jesus and about God as he did about science. Never learned that at the university. And his book after book and article after article and the one three months later after reading dozens of articles and books, the one that grabbed my attention that God used that changed everything forever for me was a scientist in Minnesota named Dr. Don Byerly, B-I-E-R-L-E. -E. And Chuck Colson gave me that book. It was June 4th, 1998, 24 years next month. And John Byerly was an atheist, a scientist, bio, a PhD biologist trying to prove to all his friends that God did not exist. And after he studied it for 10 years, obsessed with it, after studying it for 10 years, it proved to him that God does exist and Jesus is the son of God. And he became a Christian. He wrote a book called Surprised by Faith. Don Byerly wrote a book, Surprised by Faith. And when I finished that book, I got down on my knees on a concrete floor of, of 10 by 10, a roommate in a locker after having a 13,000 square foot house. And I surrendered my life to God and surrendered my life to Jesus for the first time in my life on June 4th, 1998. And I remember telling God, I said, God, how can you be a PhD scientist and not believe in God? I mean, it totally, after Chuck Colson was used such mighty way, both Ian Howes and Chuck. Ian planted seeds and Chuck helped me break that science block. But God put two wonderful guys, two servant leaders, two ambassadors for Christ in my life that changed my life forever. And then I started discipling guys in prison. I became a Christian. I had eight years yet to go. And I started discipling guys using Operation Timothy. I ended up taking 61 guys through Operation Timothy individually in prison. I helped these guys get their GEDs. And some of them spoke mostly Spanish, helped them learn how to write English and, 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 and speak better English. And really for the first time in my life at $20 a month, $20 a month after seven figures for eight years. I was $20 a month for eight years. For the first time in my life, I was helping somebody else besides myself. And they became the most productive eight years of my life were in federal prison. I be basically became a free man in prison. And I was in prison to that life of greed and addiction before I went to prison. Think about that. I became a free man in prison. The companies I stole from, Tyson Foods, Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola Consolidated, where I work now, all the victim, high fructose corn syrup, ethanol, lysine that goes into Tyson Animal Feed, the companies we stole from. Ginger was about ready to move back at home with all the legal fees I had and the fines. She was about ready to move back at home with our three kids with her mom. And they, she got a call in August of 98, two months after I surrendered my life to Jesus, said, God, I'm $20 a month. Please take care of my family. She got a call from the head lawyer representing the, the class action suits that sued to get reimbursement for all that theft over 12 years. And those companies won $3 billion back in settlements, $3 billion, $400 million for Coca-Cola alone. And they, the lawyer called Ginger, said, Ginger Whitaker, if it wasn't for you, it'd be still going on like it was for 12 years. And we're gonna give you a whistleblower reward and take care of your family the eight years your husband's in prison. The companies I stole from took care of my family for eight and a half years. And then Ginger moved everywhere I was with good behavior. You moved to a better place. I started off in Yazoo, Mississippi, not a good place. Good behavior got me to Edgefield, South Carolina, a better place. My last five years, the FBI, because of all my cooperation, got me on a Navy base. 
My last five years, I had my own office. I ordered equipment for the Navy. I did everything with the Navy. I had the barracks with the Navy, everything. The only thing is I couldn't leave the eight-acre compound and the others could leave. But, I, but, but it was a great place for, if you're in prison, I don't recommend it to anybody, but it was a great place for where I could be. Pensacola, Florida, a Navy base for the last five years. Ginger moved to each of those locations and visited me every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday for eight and a half years. Visited me every Friday, Saturday, Sunday for eight and a half years. Brought my kids. I got to know my kids. Shame on me. But I got to know my kids in federal prison that I didn't know them near like that before. I watched my son, youngest son, who was four when this all started, who's 36 now, give a testimony in Cincinnati at a CBMC luncheon three or four years ago. And I remember him saying, thank God my dad went to prison. I got to spend 20 hours a weekend with him for eight and a half years. And he didn't even know what grade I was in before that. God tremendously blessed me to keep my family and my, and my children love me and my wife today. We're married 43 years next month, Ginger and I. And the divorce rate, if you go to prison, is 78%. If you serve five years and longer, it's 99% divorce rate, the official statistic. And I went eight and a half years and we're married 43 years next month. Miracle of God. Miracle of God. And those companies taking care of my family, miracle of God. I was employed when I got, uh, when I got out of prison. Uh, I tried to take my own life. I thought, who's going to hire somebody 49 years old, a convicted felon? Was another reason why I tried to kill myself before I went to prison. Well, Cornell professors, a couple of them became Christians and started visiting me in prison and, inter and bringing biotech and pharmaceutical companies to meet me. And they'd have me review their patents and their strategic plans. And I got to meet so many companies, four of them all made an offer to me the day I got out of prison. And I joined one that had a Christian CEO because I didn't want to fall back in that greed trap that I was in all those years before. And I started off with someone like right out of college level at age 49. And I became the COO and the number two executive of that company after four promotions. And I had that position almost a decade and I'm still on their advisory board still today and was there almost a decade as COO. God gave me a second chance, but he said, this time God's way, not my way. Well, what do these guys, I wanna sum this up because we're gonna bring Ginger up here for a few minutes, but what do these guys have in common, Chuck Colson and Ian Howes? What do they have in common? Didn't know each other besides hearing about each other from me. Well, I'll tell you what they had in common. They both saw the marketplace as no better place for ministry than the marketplace. They saw it clearly. It's even why they reached out to me. All the people they were reaching out were business people. So they saw the marketplace, no better, no better place for ministry than the marketplace. Now, why is that the case? Does God have any evidence of that, that the marketplace is important for ministry? Well, let's talk about that. What does God say about our work? What was the first thing that God did? Think about that. What was the first thing that God did when God created man. The first thing that God did when he created man, he put him in the Garden of Eden. Genesis 2.15, he put Adam in the Garden of Eden and he put him to work. That's how important work was to God. Even think about the seven days of work of God where he worked, where he created man and the universe and the fish and the waters and the animals. That was work. But work's important to God. What about Jesus? What can we learn about Jesus about the importance of work? Do you know this? And I learned this from Chuck Colson, but you can Google it and it's well sourced that 122 of, of Jesus, 132 public appearances, 132, 122 of those were in the marketplace. Jesus is showing us there's no better place for ministry because that's where the lost are and the unconvinced are. So 92% of his time was in the marketplace, not at the synagogue or the temple. He was in the marketplace because that's where the lost are. What about the disciples? Where did they come from? All 12 of them came from the marketplace. Fishermen, tax collector, doctor, all came from the marketplace. After Jesus discipled them for three years, and after he ascended back to heaven, he said, go make disciples of all nations in Matthew 28, 19. Where'd he send them back to? He sent them back to the marketplace. So Peter's on that boat on Sea of Galilee, and he's catching fish to make a living, but he's also but Peter's also sharing the gospel and sharing the truth with those around it. So he's also a fisher of men in addition to fishing for a living. All those disciples went back in the marketplace. No better place for ministry 
than the marketplace. I felt strongly this. This is where God showed me the purpose of my life in June of uh, 1998, that we are Christ ambassadors here on earth, as 2 Corinthians 5.20 so clearly says. The only question is, how effective are we? Are we going to be in the stands? Or are we going to get on the field and get in the game? But we are Christ's ambassadors. And I felt strongly that. And that's Chuck Colson poured into me and helped me build my quiet time and helping me actually build a life that's around serving. And I give him so much credit that, of, of the impact he's had on my life. Now, how do you do that? How do you do be an ambassador for Christ? For me, you, you have to pray what your purpose of your life is, but where God led me is this. The purpose of our life is to be an ambassador for Christ. How we do it is Matthew 28, 19, plant seeds to non-believers, like Chuck Colson and Ian Howes did with me when they first reached out, planted seeds. And the second scripture to me in terms of purpose of life of how we do it is 2 Timothy 2, 2, where Paul poured into Timothy and he told Timothy to go share with others. And that's how you multiply. We're Christ Think about it. We're Christians today because of those disciples. Well, who are those disciples today with those original 12 in heaven? We are those disciples. God wants us to plant seeds and then to help others grow in their faith, which is 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. Plant seeds to ones that aren't yet Christians. And then when they are Christians, help them grow and mature in their faith. So I believe that's how we do it, is Matthew 28, 19, and 2 Timothy 2, 2, which is evangelism and discipleship in the marketplace. And, and you reach no more lost than in the marketplace itself. What a great mission field that we have for evangelism and discipleship. I've had Timothy since I've been in, in uh, where God's led me personally. Timothy since I was in prison. I got five Timothys still even today. Had Timothys the last 24 years, born into them, helping them mature in their faith. And also, I work for a company called Coca-Cola uh, Consolidated. It's a little different than Coca-Cola Atlanta. It's the bottling side. And we are a faith-based company. And our purpose statement, official purpose statement, our invoices, and our pay stubs is, is our only purpose is to honor God in all we do, to serve others, pursue excellence, and grow profitably. That's our official purpose statement. And we have a chaplain in every plant, 102 plant sites, over 100 prayer groups and Bible studies. We have a discipleship program where we disciple and plant, and, 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 and similar, similar to Operation Timothy, it's called Radical Mentoring, where we share the good news and the truth with either young believers or non-believers in this discipleship program. We've been doing that 10 years. We've had chaplains for 23 years. We've had this purpose statement for almost 23 years. Our purpose, only purpose to honor God in all we do. And then every quarter we do a T-Factor event. And a T-Factor is where we share with the world, 250 leaders each quarter. And just feel free to see me and I'll give you a card and happy to invite you. We do them every three months, different audience each time. And we share with the world how we integrate faith and work and the impact that's had on our company. Retention rates, our turnover being low our absenteeism being low. It's had a tremendous impact on our company and it's transformed our culture. And we share that with T-Factor with other leaders that are unrelated uh, to Coca-Cola Consolidated. The, bit, the most important decision I ever made in my life is to accept Jesus Christ in my life 24 years ago. And I stand here today on stage as an Ivy League PhD scientist, God does exist. And Jesus is the son of God, and I have no doubt in my mind about it. And it was the most important decision I ever made. And how we, and how we serve God, a wonderful place to serve is where we're at in the marketplace. To plant seeds to evangelism and discipleship, where many will get to know him. And I'm 65, so I'm, already, I'm thinking heavily on that next generation. My time here on earth is moving quickly. And I'm thinking that next generation that needs to know God where they can share with the next generation. Nothing more important than Matthew 28, 19 and 2 Timothy 2, 2, evangelism and discipleship. Mark, thank you so much for this. Uh, just in my time of briefly getting to know you and Ginger, uh, it is very evident that God had a purpose in giving you Ginger as a wife and formative for your salvation. And so Ginger, you are the undertone and the hero of a lot of this story. So we wanted to have both of them up here and take just a few minutes of uh, asking some questions 
from you guys uh, in the crowd there. So we're going to be walking around. If you have a question, just raise your hand. We'd love for you to ask them. This is going to be a few minutes just for them, and then we'll have a break, and then we'll have a panel time. So if you've had any questions listening to a story or whatnot, we'd love to go ahead and ask those now. Testy. Thank you. Hello. Thank you both so much for being here and sharing your story. Um, I'm curious to hear from Ginger. Um, hearing your story, I just couldn't help but wonder um, what were what did your support look like during this these really hard seasons, like at your local church, and also what were some scriptures that you clung to um, as a wife during this time? Well, um, during that time. Uh, I didn't have really a church, well, we had our church where we were living, but then we had to move because of the, the case. So I didn't really have a church family per se that was that I could kind of rely on. I had people praying for us, um, but my sister was here in North Carolina at Fort Bragg and had a wonderful um, group of women that were just really strong prayer warriors that just constantly prayed for, for me specifically and for our children um, and for Mark as well. But I didn't really have a, um, special group of people. And I was sharing with someone, I think it was last night, that it's really hard as Christians, we want to be really open and care about people. But when you walk into a church or a school or wherever, I was a teacher, and the first thing people generally ask is, you know, why did you move here? Or what does your husband do? Well, when your husband's in prison, that's not an easy, <laughs> you know, an easy answer. And so, you know, you just kind of back away from that um, and not really share it to, you know, because people, we're just human and we only think child molesters and rapists and murderers go to prison. We don't think about white collars. Um, but we got really good at it because eventually um, we started going to a church near us and we told him, well, my husband works for the government, which he did. He was working for the government. I wasn't Government lying. property. He was government property <laughs> and he did work for the government for $20 a month. Um, but it is hard. So I, so I always encourage people, you know, just remember that when you meet people because it was really hard. I. I long for a church family, but when you get this kind of face, when somebody says, what does your husband do? And you're trying not to lie, but not telling your whole story. And um, so that was very difficult. In terms of scripture, there are just so many people would write them on cards and send to me, and um, I couldn't name one. John 3.16 is my life verse. I just love it because I, as a mother, I can't imagine um, my children suffering. And so for God to love us so much that, you know, let Jesus suffer and take all of our sins just as beyond my comprehension. And um, i trying to think of something else. I had a couple of things I wanted to add to his thing real quick. Um, when Mark did three years of undercover, it was when they initially met with us, it was to be three weeks. Six weeks, yeah. Or six weeks. They said, it'll be no longer than six weeks. We'll get this taken care of. You know, so we're thinking six weeks, we can handle this. It turned into three years because on the tapes, they caught ADM talking about more crimes. People were bragging about, oh, well, we fixed prices in lysine. I don't know any chemicals. Um, but so they just kept telling everybody. It became 11 days, cases. Yeah, 11 cases. That's why it was three years. And so we were like, just stop telling all your crimes. You know, you're just making this go on and on. And it was so sad because we thought it was going to be six weeks. And so it did take a terrible, terrible toll on Mark because he loved the company that he worked with. During the day, he loved seeing ADM grow. That's what his specialty was. But then at night, he was tearing it down. And so that's what really took the toll on him emotionally, building something up in the day and tearing it down. So I just wanted to add those couple words. But her sister was like, a, and still is today, like Chuck Colson and Ian Howells were for me, was definitely her sister. Her sister, because we were not, keep in mind, we could not tell anybody I was wearing a wire for three years. Mm -hmm. So my parents didn't even know, or her parents did not even know, because it was not allowed to tell anybody about wearing a wire. So we were not allowed to share it. But her sister was really her bedrock during that time and even still today and not that i share it i just said there's just some things going on she said i don't need to know any details just we'll just be praying for you. So hmm. it just shows the power of prayer absolutely got a question right here thank you uh, my name is danielle first thank you for being here and sharing your story um you mentioned that um you were saved before your husband and so my question is for both of you, um, when you find yourself in whether you know in your relationship or friendship, and you have somebody who isn't 
a believer? Um, what advice would you give if you're the believer? Um, you know, interacting in that relationship with someone who is it, and vice versa. If you're that non-believer, how the person who is a believer, how to navigate that space. So I guess one for both of you, um, depending on, you know, where you are. Well, definitely we were, I mean, we're married at 21 and 20. <laughs> By the time for sure 30, when she really started putting Jesus first and, and really surrendered her life, when her mom got really sick and surrendered her life to Jesus, we were definitely unequally yoked then. I was caught up in the world, but I was blessed that instead of her walking away, she prayed for me for 10 years and stuck in there. Because a lot of families, I think, you know, a lot of families being unequally yoked like that would have a challenge. But I, I, I feel tremendous blessing that she, she prayed for me and, and hung in there for 10 years and through quite a few adversities during those 10 years. It's been a roller coaster ride with this guy. Um, I think we were so naive, we thought we were believers because we went to church. I mean, we just went to church and, and not every church is um, so intent on making sure that you are a believer. And, and I think we just kind of in our mind, well, we went to church and we believe in God. And, you know, we were just kind of quasi going through college and then it was kids. Uh, and it did take, my, my parents got divorced when I was 30 and my mom got sick and that's kind of when I just, I needed God, I had, didn't have anyone else and so, I think it was that point uh, that we really didn't realize we were unequally yoked. Even after I became a believer, because he'd gone to church as all. I mean, I just, you know, I just still had hope that in his heart he really was a believer. So. But I advise people now, you know, if someone, if you're in a relationship that's unequally yoked, really carefully pray about that because it's, it can, I have some friends, it's very, very hard. If they're strong believers and their husband is not, it's very hard on them. We'll do uh, Stone, and then we'll go to, to Mike. Hey, thanks so much. That was incredible. Praise Jesus. I am looking into pastoral ministry, and I would love to hear y'all thoughts on, you know, speaking about the workplace, you know, and equipping business leaders and those in the workplace from the pulpit, you know, from leadership positions because that doesn't happen enough. And so I would love to hear that. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I feel strongly, as, as I mentioned, that there's no, I mean, think about the loss and the unconvinced we bring into these companies. Even the company I work for now, it's Coca-Cola Consolidated and any company you work for, think about the opportunity to plant seeds. And a lot of times it's through actions, not words. I mean, it's not as walking across the hall and say, let me go over the book of John with you. They may close the door and, and not let you back in, but they see their actions and you build relationships. And just like we do in these Paul Timothy relationships that I described to you, and like Chuck Colson and Ian did me, you build a relationship, you build trust and credibility. And then at some point, these people that you're planting seeds with, that you're working with in your sphere of influence, they have an adversity in their life. And then they start saying, boy, how do you get through all you've been through in life? And then you start get to start share. Well, here, let me tell you how I got through adversity and able to say, without God, I could have never survived any of this. God took my life from ashes to beauty. You get to share your personal testimony uh, during that. And that's when they see the evidence that, wow, this person is different than them. And that's how you plant seeds where they explore that themselves and God can do their work in their heart to become Christians. I met a pastor through Mark um, that I was really impressed. Uh, one month, one weekend a month on a Saturday, he has a team of men that um, wear their shirts. And I don't remember exactly what it says, but like, you know, faith at work, but that's, I'm just seeing that here, but it's something like that. And this pastor walks through, like they have like a yes. little downtown and he, they stop and they talk to all the store owners and people that are walking, they're, they're letting them know I'm here for you. Um, and he said, it's amazing, like just the smiles on the face when he'll have the store owners will be coming out, looking forward to seeing them on that Saturday to talk to them, to, to let them know, hey, could you, pastor, could you pray for me? I, you know, one of my employees is not doing well. And I think it's just being out there, letting them know that you, if you're in pastoral studies, to that people just need to know that you're available and that you're proud of your faith and that you're out there. I, this man's been doing it for a couple of years and he said just the way that it has influenced his community is amazing that they uh, people will reach out to them uh, at the church or reach out to one of the men that's with him and I just thought that was just being bold just going out and saying if you need me I'm right here 
you know, and they know every Saturday, every one Saturday is the first Saturday of the month or whatever, that this team's gonna be walking through town and that they have somebody that's not only praying for their town and community, but can pray for them. So I, I was really impressed with that. And it's people watch our actions. I mean, our chaplains and every plan and our, the prayer groups that are going on a non-believer says, what's going on in that corner over there? You say, oh, that's a prayer group. You say, really, there's a prayer group here? And you just gradually plant seeds. And it's amazing. They get, not all of them, but a lot of them get engaged. And a lot of them, we had 644 in 2021, 644 that surrendered their life. That's just the ones publicly did, surrendered their life to Jesus uh, of our employee base. And we just... You know, we want to see 644 or 1,000, you know, this next year. We just want to continue to introduce them to God and Jesus through those relationships and just building credibility and trust. Uh, go Buckeyes, by the way, on, on the Ohio State. Way to go. Uh, could you talk about the transition in your marriage after prison? <laughs> I'm sure well, there's a couple I'll, stories I'll say in this. there. I got out. When I went in, the cell phones were like this. I got out, the cell phone was a little flip phone. I got out like 17 years, 17 years ago. It was a little flip phone. And the gas, I mean, I used to just well, go in and pay the gas station. And then it was all cards and debit cards and none of that. Yahoo and Google and eBay, none of that existed. When I went to prison, I got out and it was a different world. And I remember Ginger, I got out, her and the kids picked me up, took me to Target. And I said, the only thing I want, I've not had a chocolate milk in eight and a half years or Chinese. I drank a gallon of chocolate milk and went to a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> and first time in Target, and it just, I mean, I almost had to go sit in the car so I wasn't used to, I thought, wow, it's safer in prison than out here in a Target. You know, like it was around Christmas time. Yes at that time and then our marriage too i was so used to like doing all the checks and 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 i was kind of controlling and all of a sudden she's done it for eight and a half years and i come home and you know i'm thinking well wh what do i do where i and our son i remember him saying he was going out and i said now you're gonna be home by 10 aren't you because he was you know he was 12 when i went to prison in seventh grade he was six when i started wearing a wire and he said well, Dad, I'm, I'm a junior in college now, I'm 21. And I was saying, you know, what time are you getting home? And so it took, some, uh, it took some adjustment. Very much so, because he just came in and thought time had stood still. And it had not. I mean, he'd never, he hadn't been to the house that we lived in. So, you know, he comes in and he's like just taking over everything, moving things around, telling us all what we're supposed to do. And for eight and a half years, I've taken care of everything. So um, that was a rough little start there. I mean, thank goodness it was Christmas and we could focus on Jesus, the birth of Jesus, because otherwise we might have strangled each other because I was just like, this is weird. I don't know. What are you doing in my room? Like, just get out of here. Like, you know, this is my room and my bathroom and, you know, and... Uh, uh, but it, but God was good. You know, he, he got us through those humps and uh, we laugh about it now because, like I said, you know, he, he wanted to set boundaries for all of us and everybody had already done this for eight and a half years without him. So he's still and we controlling. Did too, I do remember we kept saying, too, when I got out, we kept referring to Romans 8, 28, mm -hmm. that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and live according to his purpose. And we kept saying that, look at all we've been through. I mean, wearing a wire three years and eight and a half years of prison and and this is going to be simple. I mean, it, it's, as complicated as it was, it was not near the adversity that we went through all the before that God will take, like Romans 8, 20, he'll take the good, bad, and the ugly in your life and turn it all to good if you let him. And we just kept reminding him of that, that all this is going to turn out good. We just need some time. And time did. After six months, it was like, was there forever. I knew how to use a gas station. I knew how to Google something. You know, it, it all fell in place. But it took, some, it took a few months. Well, uh, I want to have one final question for you guys. Do you happen to have a green lamp in your house anywhere? No green lamp. No green lamp. Okay. This is the most curious. I'll be wired right here. You won't <laughs> see me being wired. But everybody should think about it, that there is a green lamp. Because Mark did everything, he usually says this, Mark did everything right when the green lamp was there, you know. And uh, when they didn't have the green lamp, things didn't work so well. Yeah. Hmm. But everybody one. should have a green lamp that they think Well, about. God, God is that green lamp, huh? God's... God sees it all. Absolutely. And Ginger, your fortitude on that November 5th day to go and pray and to be faithful. So Thank very you. thankful for your story, Mark, and for Ginger. Can we just give them a round of applause? Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.